Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the November 28th lesson for the WRPC meeting room class. Uh, if Thanksgiving has already occurred when you are watching this lesson, we hope you and yours had a very happy Thanksgiving. We certainly are going to. Today will be our last lesson from this quarter, and it will be from the book of Acts, the lessons entitled Good News for All. And it centers around Peter as the preacher of the good news. Next week, we're going to begin a new study, a 13-week study, with a broad topic of justice, law, and history. That should be very interesting. <laughs> Everyone should have a quarterly by now. And if you've not received yours, please get in touch with Amy at the office, and we'll see that you do receive it. We're going to open this morning with prayer. I'm going to do something just a little differently and read part of the prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. So let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, <clears throat> let me bring love. Where there is offense, let me bring pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, <clears throat> let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well... By way of introducing the lesson today, let me say just a few things about Peter. Uh, Peter's certainly not a stranger to any of us. He was one of the most visible followers of Christ in the New Testament, uh, and most impactful person, probably second only to Paul. First, we can review some facts about Peter that we already know. He was born in Bethsaida. Bethsaida was a fishing village on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, uh, near where the inflow of the Jordan River came in to the sea, and it was great fishing territory. So it's not surprising that Peter was living there, that he, he was a fisherman, along with his brother Andrew. Their father Zebedee, we know, was the family head, and he also was a fisherman. Uh, we know that Peter was married because the Bible tells us that Jesus actually healed his mother-in-law at one point in time. We also know from several passages in the New Testament that Peter was an outspoken individual, easily provoked, it seems like. Uh, lastly, we know that Peter underwent almost as big, maybe as big a transformation as did Paul on the road to Damascus when Peter went to Jerusalem and changed his mind that Christianity was for Jews and supported Paul before the Jerusalem council and said, yes, I too believe that Christianity is for everyone, including the Gentiles. And I guess in a way we Oh, our being here today, uh, certainly to Paul, but also Peter, because we are Gentiles. And if it had not been for both of them, Christianity may have remained a Jewish sect of religion. You know, there have been times when I play a mental game with myself about how do certain individuals in the Bible appear physically? Uh, Let's do that with Peter. I've done it before. You know, if you look at many artist renderings of Peter, you see an older man with a gray beard, gray hair, and a scowl on his face, a big guy, uh, and that's how he comes across. Probably the average Jewish man during Jesus' day was about five feet, five inches tall. They were not big men. And uh, it's probably logical that Peter was not a 6'4 type guy that he's often portrayed as. Uh, he probably was a uh, 
a guy that had uh, blazing eyes and uh, waiting to rumble. And I think he probably had gnarled hands from pulling in fishing nets most of the week. Uh, he certainly was well sunburned and tanned from being out on the ocean all the time. And I think that uh, like most Jewish men of that day, he probably had black hair and a black beard. So, so much for Peter. Uh, we're going to turn it over now to Betsy, who's going to read our scripture for this lesson today. So, Betsy? Thank you, Jack. Our scripture lesson for today is from Acts 10, verses 34 through 47. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believed who had come with Peter, they were aston astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Okay, thank you, Betsy. And that leads us into our first discussion, which Barbara will lead, that uh, is entitled, The Spirit Pours Out on All. So, Barbara? Okay. Throughout the Bible, even the Old Testament, we can tell that God pours out the Spirit on anyone he chooses. Each week, we have daily Bible readings that go along with our lesson. The ones that we had this week show that God spoke to a pagan king in Genesis when Abraham lied and said Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. The king could have punished or killed Abraham, but he did not. Also, another example in the Old Testament in king, 1 Kings 10, 1 through 9, when the queen of Sheba heard about the wisdom of Solomon, she went to question him to see if he was that smart and so forth one after she talked to him she praised the lord god when he she realized how wise solomon was in our new testament we read of the centurion who came to jesus to ask for healing of his slave these are only a very few examples of when non-jews were affected by god in our lesson today the readings told us about cornelius a Roman army official who was a devout, God-fearing man who gave to the poor and paid regularly to God, prayed regularly to God. 
One day he had a vision in which he saw an angel who told him to send some men to Joppa and find Simon Peter. He did as he was told. The next day, Peter went to a flat roof to pray at about noon, and he fell into a trance and saw something like a sheet with all kinds of animals and uh, reptiles and birds. A voice told him to eat them, to which Peter responded, I have never eaten anything the Jewish declared impure and unclean. The voice spoke, do not call anything unclean if God has made it clean. He saw that three times and then the sheep was put back to heaven. While Peter was thinking about it, the three men from Cornelius came and the Holy Spirit assured him it was okay to meet with them. They spent the night with Peter and went to Cornelius the next day. Cornelius fell at his feet and Peter told him to stand up that he was a human being too and said God had showed him that no one should be impure, impure or unclean. They talked about the revisions, which brings us into our scripture today. The first verse, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is accepted to him is the theme of a lesson. This helps us to understand that there is no partiality in God. Our passage ends with the pouring of the spirit instead of the beginning of the passage in Pentecost, and back in Acts 2 about Pentecost. Both outpourings are followed by astonishment in the witnesses as they hear God being praised in many different languages. Differently from Pentecost, Cornelius and those with him worship and perform deeds of service as though they were Jewish, including even to those in need. At the Pentecost, the audience was most was the disciples who were there together in Jerusalem as well as followers of Jesus as followers of Jesus and also the Jews who went to Jerusalem for the major feast of Pentecost in our scripture today Peter interprets his own vision when he is gathered to Cornelius instead of interpreting what was going on at Pentecost and why the disciples were talking in many languages Peter's vision is given by God to help him understand the covenant and God's salvation is beyond under is beyond the see. I'm sorry. And okay, it's a many language. Peter's vision is given to God to help him understand the covenant and that God's salvation are beyond the Jews. In fact, it's for everyone. And the shift of the focus is from the strict rules of the law to the action of the Holy Spirit. Prior to his vision, Peter assumed that only Jews were people of God. He is learning that the Jews were not privileged above anyone else. In fact, the only privilege is for those who keep the covenant. Outpouring of the Spirit is the fulfillment of the ancient scripture. However, it doesn't happen because it's fulfillment of the scripture but God is fulfilling scripture in an ongoing way. Peter, as well as ourselves, should realize that the spirit would be poured out on anyone God chooses, regardless of church attendance, denomination, gender, race, nationality, financial status, et cetera. Okay, thank you, Barbara. You know, there are truly many amazing events in the New Testament, but I certainly think the day of Pentecost has to be high on that list of amazing events. Uh, as we know, the Holy Spirit descended on a, a very disparate group of probably all men uh, who came from different backgrounds, different countries, different languages, different ethnicities. Uh, and it was truly an amazing event. We've discussed before in one of our lessons, the movement of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lifetime and how has the Holy Spirit affected each of us throughout life? Are there times when you have felt the true presence of the Holy Spirit at more than other times? You know, one that comes to my mind uh, was what was known as the Appalachian Preaching Mission. Back in the mid-50s, uh, 
In 55, I was 17 years old. Uh, but in the mid 50s, uh, there was a week of concentrated religious worship in the Tri Cities uh, where all churches, most all churches, not all, came together uh, for nightly worship and to sing together, to hear a well noted minister from sometimes, certainly not this area, they would come from other places. And I can still remember standing, uh, I think it was in the Civic Auditorium then, uh, singing with a couple of thousand people how great they are. And here were the denominations. And it was almost like a mini day of Pentecost when you came together for those nightly meetings. And I'm really sorry we don't have that again today. But what about you guys, Betsy, anything you would like to say about memorable events of the Holy Spirit in your life? I've thought about that, Jack, and I really, I really can't um, name a particular one, but I also think that we do not remember to honor and pray for silence. You know, we're talking about the sounds of the faithful, but in your silence, what is God saying to you? Is God actually speaking to you when you're listening to hymns and listening to preaching and listening to all of the things that go on in the service? I strongly feel that we need time alone with God in silence. So that's okay. what I that's, think about. That's a, that's a different and good point, I think. Barb, how about you? Anything? Let's see. I can't think of a specific thing, but I think sometimes when I hear the good stories that cause people to do things to help others, you know, like... Uh, Oh, there's been like the man that paid for people's college education and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of different to me, but I just feel like something has, it shows me that there are still good people and good things happen. And that helps me to know that I need to do more to help others and things. And I think sometimes the Holy Spirit will make me realize I'm not doing as much as I could do to help others or in mm -hmm. some things like that. So I guess that's not a very good one, but that's one way okay. sometimes that's, I think. Oh, well, that, that, that's a good thought. Very good thought. Thank you. Well, the whole thing with this is that, that God really doesn't show partiality. Uh, and Betsy is going to talk to us about that now. Betsy? God shows no partiality. What does that mean? That means that one person isn't superior to another in the eyes of God. What can longing for God and commitment to his covenant produce in your life? That's what Barbara was just talking about. And we go back and think about our life journey and our faith journey. Are they different or are they intertwined? We seek others to help us grow our faith, our, the experiences that we have, but God chooses us first. We do not choose him. Core doctrine and practices do not determine the faithful servants of God. Sometimes doctrines separate us. Think about the groups of people that belong to different denominations within Christianity. No race, nation, people, language, gender, or faithful practice can divide us as God's people. The Holy Spirit guides and protects us as we seek God's movement in our lives, we learn 
from what others believe. Set in the company of the faithful, God emphasizes that there is no end to community and fellowship. As we worship, heed the spoken word and the silence, all these boundaries can be crossed by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. He joins us. There is no limit to God's grace and the manner he chooses to reach us and touch us is very diverse. Good comments, thank you. Before Barbara gets into stepping into the world section, let me just play out a little more the subject of God's impartiality. Uh, you know, we're well acquainted from the New Testament that there was a movement by a group of early Christians that were called the Judaizers, or the Judaizers, however you want to pronounce it, they believe that before you could become admitted to the church, you first must be a good Jew in standing. We know that Paul rejected this belief and this argument, and uh, ultimately defeated that belief. God was impartial and that Jesus offered salvation to all who wanted to accept him as the resurrected son of God. Well, I raise the question, how about today? Let's just suppose that before anyone could be admitted to a church membership, let's take the PCUSA. Let's just suppose before anyone could be admitted to the church membership, they would need to be accepted to do that. But let's say we did, and on one occasion, a poorly dressed, smelly, alcohol smell, homeless man came to the session meeting asking to be admitted as a member. How do you think that secret vote would go? Do you think there would be all yeses? Or do you think there might be one no or more no's in the tally? Let me raise a second possibility. Let's say there was a young professional couple that moved into the neighborhood and started attending the church. They came to the session seeking admission as members of the church. The only fly in the ointment was they were both gay males and married to each other. How do you think the session vote in secret would go on that? Would there be any slips of no or any black balls put into the voting pool? So the question is, what do you guys think about here and now about God's impartiality as it affects individual Christians? Any comments, Betsy? No, I think you've brought up two very uh, distinct possibilities. We have evolved from the time of Peter and different situations now present themselves but what we're trying to figure out is who God is accepting and God does not show partiality. Okay, Barbara, any thoughts on that? Uh, now, I agree with both of you and the thing sometimes I think when we think with the judge and stuff, I have to go back and say, thanks be to God that he's the judge and I don't have to make right. the decisions right. and stuff. So that, that's in part of my talk about stepping to the world is um, God loves us all. He loves everybody. And, uh, you know, there's so many people got different opinions on the two subjects you talked about and stuff that each time I have to just say, thank God that he has to be the, he's the judge, you know. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the fact's clear. God accepts everyone who professes mm -hmm. belief in Jesus Christ as the one who provides us with everlasting life if we accept him into our lives. So m moving on into stepping into the world. So Barbara, you have that section. The last three months, our lesson theme has been celebrating God. We have read and discussed praise, singing and worship. 
In our lesson today, Peter exemplifies how our Christian life and worship influence one another. We step from the word into the world and hopefully we realize that as far as God's concerned, there are no borders or boundaries within God's people for us to see. In John 10, 16, Jesus tells us, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and they shall be one flock and one shepherd. Our study Revelation Acts 10 speaks to the fact that we are actually one, uh, regardless of gender, preferences, anything. God sees us all as being equal. We should do as Peter did in Acts 10 when God tells us to do something. Peter went where God led him to go, did what God led him to do, and even changed his mind as God expanded his imagination. There's been things I've had to change my mind about, you know, in my lifetime. There are times when we might not want to do or accept what we feel God wants us to do and may even run from it. But God knows best. The question we may have is how to listen for God's leading. In verse 34, Peter says, I truly understand. Other words for well, understanding could be learning and comprehending. This indicates new discoveries about that God is continuing, that Peter is continuing to learn, which leads into new discoveries about God, rather than making a pronouncement about whether or not the case, about the case of God and whether God's going to judge somebody a certain way that oh, we don't know. We should follow their behavior. Wait a minute. We should follow his example when we attempted to judge others for their behavior or beliefs, especially someone else's relationship with God. Thanks to be to God that he knows a person's heart. Just as Peter's orientation to God continues to lead to, lead to new discoveries, our prayers to and listening to God speak to us should lead us to other people that God loves and wants us to accept and to possibly tell them about Jesus if it's appropriate. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit, even if it means getting out of our comfort zone. It's not easy to know if it's our mind or the Holy Spirit leading us, but if in prayer and worship we listen and respond to God's leading, worship and that prayer can open up to God and others. Thank you. Yes, very good. And that brings to a close our lesson. Betsy's going to close us with prayer. Holy Father God, we so often wonder who it is that we're supposed to follow. It is you we are supposed to follow, to listen for your guidance. But remember, those around us have relationship with you that may help us grow. Let us listen to those people around us as they discuss what they believe and why they believe. Please help us to listen for you, to have the courage to follow what you are telling us to do. You are our God. You are our leader. Let us follow in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. See everybody next week. Have a good one. Thank you. Have a good Thanksgiving.